Chapter 9. You are enough. You will be too much for some people. Those aren't your people. Although I'm blessed to have two great parents who were incredibly strong and stable, every family goes through stuff and mine was no exception. When I was around 10 years old, we went over to my grandparents' house for dinner. When we walked into the living room, there was my mom's dad, Grandpa Dietrich, sitting on the couch in his underwear. No shirt, no shoes, just underwear. What is Grandpa doing? I wondered. Then, out of nowhere, he started to tell stories from his childhood and growing up during the Great Depression. He was slurring his words. My parents were not drinkers, their friends were not drinkers, and neither were my other family members, so I'd never seen anyone in that state before. In that moment, I realized my grandpa was an alcoholic. Up until then, I thought my family was perfect. My parents never fought and had been married for 20 years, and the three of us were as tight-knit as you could be. My grandparents were married for more than 50 years, and no one in my extended family, with the exception of my mom's sister, was divorced. Plus, my four cousins and I were really close. After that day, my grandpa's drinking just got worse, and my parents didn't shield me from it. They always treated me like an adult and were very open with me, which I think is one reason I've always been able to manage things in my life. I learned my grandpa had severe depression and would try to numb the pain by drinking. There were many nights when he would get so drunk that my grandma couldn't take it a second longer. She would come to our house to spend the night, something that became a normal part of my life. At one point, she rented her own little place in town. She's one of the strongest people I know, but eventually, she went back to him. My grandpa and dad were the best of friends, so many nights my grandpa would call our house drunk and ask my dad to get him some whiskey. I can't do that, my dad would say. Then I'll get it myself, my grandpa would respond. Not wanting him to drive drunk, my dad would then have to drive the half hour to my grandparents' house and spend the night talking to my grandpa. One time, my grandpa threatened to kill himself. Worried that he'd do something reckless, my family members called the sheriff. I didn't have close friends growing up, but I never told the few that I did have or anyone else that my grandpa was an alcoholic. I was very embarrassed. Right before my middle school graduation, my grandma was staying with us almost on a nightly basis. If grandma's going to come to my graduation, she can't talk about grandpa's drinking, I told my parents. I worried that people outside our family would find out. After that, my grandpa went to rehab for three months and was completely sober for six years until my sophomore year of college. He also found God. It was such a turning point for him and our family. In the end, even his faith wouldn't prevent tragedy but knowing he is in heaven is a comfort for my family. Despite his drinking, I always looked up to my grandpa because he was one of the hardest working people I knew. He and my grandma got married when they were just 16 years old and had their first child, my uncle, the same year. They lived in a trailer on a ranch where my grandpa worked incredibly hard. With just an eighth grade education, he built a multi-million dollar ranch from nothing. My grandma, who didn't graduate from high school, helped him, and together were two of the hardest working and most resilient people I knew. It was a very tough time, and there was an incredible amount of pressure to make it. Although my grandpa was very successful, he always strived to be better. I think it's because he grew up during the Depression and with a father who was an abusive alcoholic. From the time he was a young child, his father would tell him that he wasn't good enough, he wasn't tough enough or smart enough. His dad didn't shower him with compliments. My grandpa was brilliant, had a great family, built an incredibly successful business from the ground up, but it was never enough, and his depression kicked in especially hard when he felt inadequate. My grandpa was also a fun-loving prankster. He and I were especially close because we shared a love of politics. It was something we bonded over. Grandpa had Fox News on the television 24-7 with the volume up so loud that my grandma was constantly yelling, Turn that down! She didn't like it, but I loved it. I remember being at their house and watching Hannity and Colmes. My grandpa also loved Glenn Beck. Funny how things come full circle. In fact, he used to call my house to make sure my parents were recording Glenn Beck for me. When I was a freshman in college, I heard there was going to be a Glenn Beck Tea Party rally in Rapid City, South Dakota. I volunteered to work it so I could get tickets for my grandpa and me. My job was to bring people up to Glenn to take pictures. Make sure you tell him I'm his biggest fan, my grandpa said, and I did. That was a special moment for us, especially because one year to the day of that rally, my grandpa committed suicide. This is why getting the job at the Blaze five years later was so significant. It was a connection with my grandpa, 
who would have been so disappointed to learn who Glenn Beck really was. In October of my sophomore year of college, I was in my apartment at UNLV when my phone rang. It was my mom. Grandpa shot himself, she said. What? I was stunned. I knew he struggled with depression, but I had no idea that he had started drinking again. My parents and grandmother knew and tried to stop him. Don't worry, in three more days, it'll be okay, he told them. Then, in two more days, it'll be okay. My family thought he just needed to get through this depression, but he was counting down until he was going to kill himself. Just three days from when he started to drink again, he shot himself in my grandparents' bedroom. Apparently, he stopped taking his antidepressants because he hated how tired they made him feel. Unfortunately, his depression got bad again, which is what made him fall off the wagon. He loved life, but he loved being a success more, and he thought his return to drinking would disappoint and burden our family. This was too much for him to handle. I flew back to Rapid City the next day for the funeral, which was on Halloween. That was a tough time for my whole family, especially for my dad. They all knew that my grandpa had started drinking again, but not how bad it was. Every day, my dad would call my grandma. How is he doing? He'd ask. He's drinking, but he's fine, she'd say. But he wasn't fine. And honestly, my dad is convinced to this day that if my grandma had told him how bad it really was, he could have gone down there and saved him. I'm not sure if that's true, but I know that my dad lives with that every single day. Some part of him will always hold it against my grandma. It's not obvious when we're together, but he doesn't like going to her house for family events, and I don't think he will ever forgive her for that and for being so callous after his death. When my grandpa shot himself, my grandma was in town having lunch with my mom and my aunt. She came home to him dead on their bedroom floor. But she just cleaned up the blood and slept in there that night. What the hell? All of us were shocked. It was mystifying. Grandma didn't even seem to be mourning. She almost seemed relieved. They had a horrible relationship and shouldn't have been together. My grandma did everything, but my grandpa was very hard on her. He would tell her that she wasn't good enough, not a good enough cook, not a good enough cleaner. I didn't understand it at the time, but now I know that when someone is attacking you, it's because of their own insecurity. My grandpa didn't feel that he was good enough, so what did he do? He projected it on my grandma. I don't blame her for feeling a sense of relief when he passed away. It might not sound good, but sometimes the truth doesn't sound good or even make you feel good. It just is. On the way back from the funeral, my cousins were talking about not telling people that Grandpa committed suicide. Most of them were ashamed. At first, I was a little embarrassed, too. Suicide was not discussed publicly the way it is today, and most people don't lose a grandparent that way. It's not always easy to talk about, but I decided to be open. Keeping it to myself wouldn't help anybody. Talking about it just might. I dedicated my final thoughts to telling the story both at my first show on One America and again on my show at The Blaze. Even the best families go through stuff. We should be able to have a conversation about it. My grandpa committed suicide because he never felt good enough. This resonates with me in every area of my life because I have his type A personality. That's why I work so hard to stay grounded and count my blessings. I know how quickly it can consume you. My grandpa was never famous, but he felt like he needed to accumulate all this money or else he would not be good enough. His motivation wasn't greed, it was a need for validation. Sometimes I think that if I'm not doing X, Y, and Z, then I'm not good enough. I've heard it from former bosses, I've heard it from the left, and I've heard it from the right. I've heard it from total strangers, lots of them, on social media. I've been told I'm not smart enough, I'm not pretty enough, and I'm not conservative enough. I'm not educated enough or polished enough. I've been told, you went to a shitty school, so why are you an expert on this? You name it, someone has told me that I'm not enough of it. That's why having confidence in yourself is so important. I saw that my grandpa didn't have that. He was brilliant and built something from nothing. He worked from the ground up and was incredibly successful, but it didn't matter. It was never enough. He was on a never-ending search to fill that hole, and he ended his life empty because of it. However, People who want to change you are usually people who are trying to avoid fixing themselves. Because of my grandpa's depression and suicide, I now mentor several girls whom I call my number ones. There are three in particular. I talk to them daily on Instagram, and they know they can DM me day or night. They've been my biggest fans for the longest time and will drive hours to come to my events. 
One is Sydney, a 22-year-old who struggled with depression and drug addiction. Then a friend told her about my final thoughts. They made me realize that I had to stop acting like a victim and take ownership of my life and the choices I was making, Sydney said. She worked hard to turn her life around and now is completely clean and sober. Always interested in politics, she used some of the stuff I said on Final Thoughts to debate with her friends, and this helped her find a purpose. Today, she writes political blogs, some of which I retweet. Her friend Kathy is also one of my number ones. She is currently struggling with depression and reaches out to me to share her difficult but honest thoughts. She recently came out as a conservative and found that a lot of her friends turned on her. The third girl, Ellie, was a high schooler who reached out when her school's administration came down on her for posting conservative videos. They tried to make her take them down, but she refused. I reposted some of them, and she got an amazing response. Weeks later, her boyfriend told me that she had just admitted herself to the hospital for bipolar depression and suicidal thoughts. I tried to help her through it by telling her about my grandpa and said I know what it feels like. I told her not to be ashamed or embarrassed. In the end, she pushed through it and ended up going to a military school and then getting into a good university to study politics. It's so important to me to mentor these girls because I realize the impact that I can have, and it's one I take very, very seriously. I don't care about recognition from conservative websites or bloggers or the media. I care about recognition from girls like these because I wouldn't be here without them. They message me when they're having tough times and I try to help get them through with a text or inspirational quote and help them find their purpose. And honestly, they help me and inspire me more than I help them. On my darkest, most stressful days, when someone is going after me on Twitter or I'm frustrated at work, they remind me why I do what I do. Being there for them also helps me deal with the loss of my grandpa and reminds me that we all have something in common. Sometimes the way you grow up makes you used to bad things. Something that ought to be a deal breaker seems normal to you. At the time of my grandfather's death, I was dating my first boyfriend, Brian. We'd been together for four years at this point, and I wasn't happy. Watching how my grandmother reacted made me think. It clicked for me. I couldn't be with Brian anymore. I didn't want to have a relationship like my grandparents, and yet I was headed in that direction. I could see that pattern. Brian and I dated for six years starting my sophomore year of high school. Brian was a cocky, entitled star baseball player, or at least that was the front he put up. As a baseball player who can throw the ball 90-plus miles per hour, he was a big fish in the small pond of Rapid City. After all, plus miles per hour, he was a big fish in the small pond of Rapid City. After all, we only had two main high schools, and the whole town was just 70,000 people. But I knew Brian, and I mean really knew him. Behind his star athlete persona, he was incredibly insecure. His parents loved him, but they seemed to love him even more when he did well in baseball. It was obvious, but he would never admit it or how much this hurt him. That's why he became attached at the hip close with my dad, who tried to mentor him on how to be a good man. My dad couldn't care less if Brian did well in baseball or even played baseball. My whole family saw and cared about the person he was regardless of sports. That's why I never broke up with him, even when he was mean and condescending, constantly telling me that I was nothing and dragging me down. He would belittle me and my dreams. He also cheated on me so many times, three times in high school alone. He put me and my confidence through the ringer. As confident as I was academically and professionally, my personal confidence came much later. I would make excuses for him, telling myself, that wasn't the real Brian who did that to you. That was the fake Brian putting on a show. I also kept getting back together with him because he was my first boyfriend and best friend, and good or bad, he had shaped a lot of my life. I knew when I was 16 years old that this relationship was not going to work out, but I held on to it and held on to it. I should have never stuck around as long as I did, but I loved him unconditionally. When I say I'm loyal to a fault, this is a perfect example. I also wasn't strong enough to walk away, and Brian preyed on that. In fact, toward the end of our relationship, Brian knew I was on the way out the door. He could feel it. So what did he do? He would call me and insinuate he may hurt himself. He knew this would have a dramatic impact on me because of my grandpa. He used it to control me. He still cheated on me numerous times, which was not only painful but embarrassing because everyone at school knew before I did. 
The mean girls thought it was funny to say things about it to me. If we find someone who tells us what we want to hear, we fall in love with that feeling, not always with that person, and we do whatever is needed to hold on to it. That was me. Sometimes it doesn't matter if the person is condescending and horrible 90% of the time. We hold on to that somewhat decent 10%. I admit, I held on to that 10% for way too long. Now it's such a disappointment for me to look back on that experience because I can't believe I let someone have such a hold over me. When we graduated from high school, we both went to UNLV for college. Brian got a baseball scholarship and I was going to study journalism. The first week I felt totally alone and Brian was nowhere to be found. He was too busy with his new baseball friends while I didn't know anyone. Getting to play Division I baseball is a huge accomplishment, especially when you come from a small town, so he was super cocky about being on the team and he was treating me like crap. I am king shit around here, he told me. I'll stay with you because I feel sorry for you, but just know I'll probably cheat on you, he said. That was his way of dumping me while still holding on in case he needed me. I had to untangle myself from him and the only way to do that was to leave UNLV. If I didn't make a big move and stop the pattern, it would never end. Yes, we got back together. But when you're with someone for years and you practically grew up with them, it takes a few goodbyes before the final one. I called my mom. If I stay here, I'm going to fall back into this relationship because it's comfortable, I said. So just five days after my parents had moved me into my dorm, my mother flew to Vegas to help me move out. I went back to South Dakota and enrolled in a local engineering school for the first semester of my freshman year and lived at home for a few months before heading back to UNLV for the spring semester. I thought people would view it as me running back home, but it wasn't. I had been with Brian for two and a half years. By leaving, I was saying, I can't do this anymore. This cycle has to end, and the only way is if I leave. Well, guess what? As soon as I left, Brian would call me bawling about how he couldn't get through school without me. I need you, he'd cry into the phone. Even his parents got involved. Tommy, can you please go back to Vegas because Brian can't do this without you, they said. What did I do? I spent my own money to fly to Vegas and stay in a hotel room so that I could visit him four times during that first semester. We got back together. Little did I know, he was cheating on me that whole time and not only that, but bragging about it in the locker room. One of his baseball teammates later told me Brian would boast about how many times he'd cheated on me and how pathetic I was for continuing to come and see him in Vegas. At that point, it was like an appendage, like a tumor. I knew he was so bad for me, but the pain of removing the tumor was scary. It seemed worse than the pain of being in the relationship. On top of that, I loved him. Since then, I've learned that true maturity is being able to love somebody even though they may not love you back, but I wasn't there yet. I decided to go back to UNLV for spring semester. I feel really bad about everything that I did. Can we go find our classes together before the semester starts? He asked. Okay. After walking around campus, we drove to get groceries. We were in Brian's car when the girl he cheated with called. His phone was connected to Bluetooth, so the whole conversation was on speaker, and it gets better. The girl told him that she thought she was pregnant, and he was arguing with her and telling her she needed to get an abortion. Where am I, I thought. When they hung up, Brian broke down crying because he was so worried about her having the baby. Baseball will be over for me, and my parents will be so disappointed, he cried. Can you call my dad and tell him? Yes. The truth is stranger than fiction, and guess what? I did it. I called his dad. Brian is terrified to tell you this, but he thinks he got a girl pregnant and he doesn't know what to do, I told him. I need to talk to him, his dad said. So I sat there as they talked on the phone about another girl being pregnant. This is the worst, I thought. But again, I stepped in to take care of him. It turns out the girl was lying about the whole thing. You would think I would have ended it there, but no. We continued to date for three and a half more years. By the time we were sophomores, Brian had so many injuries that he could no longer play baseball. 
He went to college thinking he was going to get drafted, so this was devastating to him, and that's when his emotional attacks on me got worse. Funny, because when he was on top of the world, he treated me like shit. And then when things started to unravel, he still treated me like shit. It just goes to show that a crappy person is a crappy person, and people are either going to treat you well or they're not. Their behavior is not always dependent on the situation. Without baseball and his teammates, Brian lost his identity and became clingy and possessive. He wanted to hang out all the time, but I was going to school full-time and working a retail job at Express. By the end of the day, I was tired and didn't want to be around anyone. Still, he'd pressure me to come over. It was a control thing for him, something I didn't realize at the time. When I did hang out with him, I would literally count the minutes until I could leave. And the thought of Brian physically touching me repulsed me. I just wanted out. This was no way to live, yet I felt like I couldn't get out of this relationship. Anytime I tried to break up with Brian, he'd go into a dark and depressed state. Something he knew would work to keep me because it was just a year after my grandpa ended his own life. This brought me back to that awful time. People find your triggers and exploit you, and that's what Brian did. He was trying to use the biggest tragedy in my life to manipulate me. I don't even know if he realized how hard it was on me. I loved the guy. I truly did. Part of me will always love him. It wasn't easy to walk away. It was one of the hardest things I have ever done. I know a lot of people are in the position I was in, and it's not easy. Although I knew that I didn't want to be with Brian, I also knew that he was going to act irrationally if I broke up with him. I stayed with him longer and longer because I didn't want to have to deal with his reaction. I had seen his anger issues earlier in our relationship. For example, freshman and sophomore year, if his coach didn't put him into play during a baseball game, he'd be so mad that he'd take it out on me afterward. He'd call me every name in the book. He'd slam doors and punch holes in the walls. Finally, in March of my junior year, I couldn't take it anymore. After two years of trying to get out of that relationship, I broke up with Brian for good. Of course, he didn't make it easy. He would text me so many times in a row that my phone would physically shut down. He lived across from me in the same apartment complex, so he would stand at the window and wait for my car to pull in. Then he'd send me nasty texts. He even insinuated he might do something to my car or slash my tires. He followed me to the gym, trying to convince me to change my mind. It was bad. Once he was done playing baseball, he didn't have an identity anymore, and he took all that out on me. He tried to control me, and for a long time, it worked. But once I broke up with him, he lost control, and he went apeshit. After I broke up with him, I never thought he was going to physically hurt me, but I knew he wouldn't leave me alone. I threatened to get a restraining order, something I really didn't want to do. I didn't want to ruin his life. I just wanted him to get the hell out of mine. I took matters into my own hands. When school was out, I decided to go home that summer before my senior year. Looking back, I realized that Brian was insecure about his intelligence. His parents put so much weight into him being a baseball player and didn't give him the confidence that he could do anything else. He was lost and insecure. He had to put me down to build himself up. He cheated on me because he was insecure and needed validation. Brian was my best friend, and I won't take that away from him. I owe a lot of the fact that I never partied or drank in high school to Brian because we did everything together. But his verbal abuse affected my confidence. It got into my head. Because Brian couldn't control his injuries or baseball, he tried to control me and projected his insecurities on me, and it worked. I didn't realize it until I was out of the relationship, which is something that happens to a lot of women, even strong, successful women. People are always surprised when I tell them about Brian and the way that I allowed him to treat me. They think it wouldn't happen to me because I'm so confident in myself, but you aren't always confident in all areas of your life. Today, I would never put up with that, but it took a lot of reflection to figure it out. I always thought, no one is going to make me do this or that, so I didn't think he had control over me. But looking back, I realized he had an immense amount. Sometimes, it's just not as blatant and obvious especially when you're young or you think you love someone. Here's another issue involving someone else telling you you're not enough. You can take it to heart long after they're gone. You hear their voice in your head. Brian used to tease me and call me names like Tubble Lumpkin and question what I was eating. Although I wasn't overweight at all, he got so deep into my head that I always thought I was. 
It bothered me, so when I finally broke up with him, my confidence was at an all-time low. I'm going to get really skinny, I thought. Now I was in control, but I took it overboard. That's when I started running. At first, it was a very positive and healthy thing for me, but I became obsessive about it. I also became obsessive about food. I would calculate what I ate down to the last ingredient and had a very calorie-restrictive diet. Although I was eating healthy, I was not eating enough, and I was running seven miles a day. By the summer after my junior year, I was under 100 pounds. At 5 feet 4, that's way too skinny, something I couldn't see. On my 21st birthday, my grandma said, Tommy, you look like you're in one of those world hunger commercials. I was so mad and devastated. Other people said things to me too, but I just got defensive. I couldn't see the problem. Yes, it can be helpful to know what you're eating and it's important to choose healthy foods, but I got crazy about it. I was at the point where I eat almost nothing all day and then gorge myself at the end of the night. I was often lightheaded and dizzy. I also stopped going out with friends because I was afraid if there was something like pizza in front of me, I'd eat it. And if I did succumb to foods that weren't on my rigid plan, I'd beat myself up and feel like a failure. I was super skinny all through my senior year, but my confidence slowly began to come back when I started hosting a show called The Scramble for UNLV TV in the second semester of my senior year. Then I started working in San Diego where I began making friends and going out more, something I couldn't do and live in my restrictive world. Eventually, I realized that I had to live my life and that sometimes you have to break your routine. Slowly, I gained the weight back and stopped obsessing. I still don't like to miss days of running, but I eat what I damn please. It's mostly healthy, but if I eat something that's not, I don't beat myself up over it. When I started to get more personal strength and let go of the mind block that ruled my life, I got over it. Finally, I stopped hearing Brian say I wasn't good enough and instead heard myself say that I was. Although it wasn't as bad or traumatic as my relationship with Brian, the boyfriend I had after college also made me feel less than. I met him when I moved to San Diego for One America. He was a Navy SEAL named Jason. He was with me when my career was taking off. Even though I was always proud and excited about his accomplishments, he made me feel like mine were no big deal. No matter what I did, I could not impress him. Anytime something really exciting happened in my life, he made me feel insecure about it. For example, when I found out that I was in a Jay-Z song, I called him. Oh my God, I'm in a Jay-Z song, I told him excitedly. I just sent it to you, listen to it. Oh cool, he said half-heartedly. I'm going to go out with my friends now, I'll listen later. Of course, he never listened. He had the same lackluster reaction when I said I was going to a Dallas Cowboys dinner with Tony Romo and when I came home elated about my first paid speech. I wanted to share these things with him, but he acted like he didn't care. It was so deflating. I felt like he wasn't proud of me and this left me feeling very insecure. Instead of getting excited and feeling proud about accomplishments that were important to me, he focused on all the things I wasn't. I wasn't outdoorsy. I didn't want to go camping. I couldn't be at one event of his because I was working. I could not figure out why I wasn't good enough. And then he dumped me, twice, on the phone. You can imagine how that made me feel. I knew for a long time Jason and I weren't right for each other, but I always defended his character by saying he never cheated on or betrayed me. Plot twist, at a friend's wedding in San Diego just months ago, I was told by mutual friends that Jason did, in fact, cheat on me. It gets worse. Not only did he cheat on me, the girl he cheated with revealed to my friend she knew about me the whole time. In fact, she would drive him to the airport to come see me in Dallas. Yeah, finding that out after over two years of telling people he never cheated makes me feel like a jackass. Now I see that he was incredibly insecure, but when you're in it, you think the problem is all you. I haven't shared these very personal and painful stories with a lot of people, but I'm sharing them now to make a point. You may have been in a bad situation or had someone do destructive things to you, but nothing is black and white. There are bright points and dark points to everything, and you can learn from any situation, even awful ones. Not just bad boyfriends. I still think of my time at The Blaze as an incredible opportunity and one I learned a lot from. After my one-year anniversary at Fox, I thought about how I got there and realized that The Blaze provided the stepping stone that I needed. It wasn't easy, but it was necessary. 
The same goes not only for everyone who has fired me and put me through a lawsuit, but those who have dumped me like Jason or cheated on me like Brian. Although these experiences were difficult and painful, they were so formative that I wouldn't take back any of them. I learned so much. The most powerful lesson is to reflect on everything and to find out why something is bothering you, why it's a trigger. For example, there are still times when I have dreams about Brian and I know it has nothing to do with him. It's my inner insecurity that's still there. When conservatives say on Twitter that I'm not smart enough and that I am where I am because I'm pretty, I ask myself, why is that a trigger for me? Because Brian would tell me that I was not good enough. I am grateful for every single one of those things because that's why I am where I am today. If I hadn't been through those things and learned to fight for what I wanted, I might have become a woman who still allows people to tell her how to talk, act, think, dress, and live. I've been there and learned from that behavior and I won't tolerate it anymore. I know the red flags and I avoid going down those rabbit holes. If I hadn't been through those things and learned to fight for what I wanted, I might have been one of many conservatives who, when they're told, we don't want you to do this or you're too controversial, fold to the pressure. But now I know this is who I am and this is what I want. I don't regret anything I've done because every misstep I've made and person I trusted wrongly have led to where I am and all the good things that I have in my life now. Sometimes you don't realize that you have toxic people in your life because you think you can change them. You can't. I have a friend whose cheating boyfriend is in therapy to try to change his ways. You may be the inspiration for him to go to therapy, but you don't have to stay with him. I've also learned that you cannot control other people. All you can do is control your reaction and know when to get out. I used to think that if I was watching Brian all the time and looking at his phone, somehow I could prevent him from cheating on me. But you're not going to keep a liar from lying, you're not going to keep a crook from being a crook, and you're not going to keep a cheater from cheating. Brian is the perfect example. We spoke a few months ago for the first time in four years. I have the same number I had in high school, so he texted me. Sorry if you've been trying to reach out to me. I discovered that my wife blocked your number in my phone. Um, no. Still, I wished him well and we spoke on the phone to catch up on each other's lives. I have nothing against him now and only wish him the best. I brag about you to people all the time and tell them that I dated you, he said. Isn't it funny I used to say you were going to be nothing and now look where you are. Funny how things work out, isn't it? Then he told me that he googled my net worth too. I should have held on because you could have been my sugar mama, he said. You piece of shit, now you're impressed? The next day, Brian texted me again, and it didn't take long to realize he hadn't changed a bit. What if I didn't have the courage to walk away from him, I thought. I'd be that girl. At first, I wasn't good enough, and I needed his praise, but now I just feel sorry for him. He's always on the lookout for bigger and better things. It made me thankful that God showed me the way out of that relationship years ago. Yes, he jolted me out of it, but sometimes it has to get that bad because if it doesn't, you're not going to leave. If it doesn't, you're not going to change. He is someone else's concern now, and I wish them the best of luck. One thing I realized is that you shouldn't wait to be proud of yourself only after you succeed. Be proud of who you are, and it will help you succeed. The bottom line is this. Don't listen when someone tells you that you're not enough. Don't ever let that seep into your brain. Don't let anyone ever tell you that you're not smart enough, pretty enough, fun enough, or whatever enough. Don't let them tell you that you are where you are because of your looks or connections or that you didn't go to a good enough school. Don't ever let anyone reduce you because when you do, you give them power. And the truth is this, the reason they're saying you're not enough is that you're too enough and it scares them. That's their problem, not yours.